So one of the main things that stood out to me last week, was anybody blessed by part one? Part one? One of the main things or the nucleus, or if there was a quote that I could take from part one of this new series, Exit Strategies, it would be, whenever God gives you deliverance, deliverance must be followed by demolition. Because when God brings you out of a thing, whenever God brings you out, stay out. Can I get somebody to say stay out? Stay out. Listen, church family, you do not have the right to remain silent. For the next 10 to 15 seconds, I need y'all to preach with me. Every time I point at you, I want y'all to shout, stay out. So let's practice. Stay out. When God brings you out, stay out. the very thing that was sabotaging your peace, you said, God, if this is not your will, reveal it to me. And he revealed to you it's not his will. Now you have to. Stay out. The thing that's not conducive to your biblical intelligence. Stay out. The thing that's causing for you to be carnal. Stay out. When God gets you out. Stay out. When God gets you out. Stay out. Don't look back, but. Stay out. Don't go back, but. Stay out. Stay out. That. Listen, you don't even recognize for somebody that's prophetic. <laughs> Whatever you've been praying for, God is saying, stay out. But here's the difficult part. Whenever God brings you out, that does not mean your circle wants to get out too. See, this is how it hurts. Because just because you get out doesn't mean your mama wants to get out too. Just because you get out doesn't mean your daddy wants to get out, your friends want to get out. The fastest way to frustrate yourself is for you to try to convince people to glean from health who don't want it. Talk Holy Spirit. The fastest way, like until they taste average and it starts tasting bitter. Until they become allergic to mediocre living. And this is why, please hear me, this is why people pleasing is so dangerous. People pleasing is so dangerous because those who are unhealthy for your next, <laughs> those who are unhealthy for your next will start criticizing you and start trying to make you feel bad for the boundaries that the Holy Spirit is establishing in your now. Did y'all hear what I just said? When you start to recognize this is unhealthy, that this is not conducive for my life, and this is what we have to understand. You are not required, and it is not your responsibility to become a version of yourself that's easier for them to digest. Did y'all hear what I just said? Like, it's not your responsibility to make yourself an individual that's easier for them to digest. I'm not doing this to teach you a lesson. That's manipulation. I'm not doing this to teach you a lesson. I'm doing this because I learned mine. Talk Holy Ghost. I'm doing this because I learned mine and I now have the courage and I now have the calling awareness and who I am in Christ enough to recognize whatever room God you want me to walk out of, whatever stronghold that you need me to walk out of, whatever atmosphere that you need me to walk out of, whatever mindset that you need me to walk out of, whatever self-sabotaging circle that is assistant to my demise, give me the strength, give me the confidence to walk out of it if it hurts my purpose God help me walk out of it because I'd rather have a hurt heart but fulfill my purpose than hurt my purpose and make my heart happy whatever I have to do God if I have to walk out and it hurts give me the strength to overcome it if I have to walk out and lose some friends give me the strength to overcome it if I have to walk out and they're going to talk about me give me the strength to endure their criticism and their comments because you are an exit strategist and I'm thankful that you showed me the exit Woo, I'm trying to teach this thing, y'all. Somebody say, stay out. stay out. And I believe many times the issue that we're facing today in church, the issue that we're facing today in Christendom, if you will, is so many of us are hiding our issue. Mm -hmm. Hiding our secrets. 
So you have secret warfares. And unfortunately, many times the church has not made it a safe place for you to be transparent. Because if, if you really knew what I was dealing with, if you really knew what I was dealing with, you would embarrass me? If you really knew my struggle in the dark, you would use it as sermon content? Come on. If you really knew what I was dealing with, see, but you're so caught up rebuking me. And this is the thing that I keep asking, how are you rebuking somebody who has never been discipled? <laughs> how can you rebuke someone who doesn't know? Whenever there's a church or ministry that proclaims and rocks the title of Jesus, but it is not a place that's, that's conducive for your spiritual evolution, it is not striving to give you discipleship or help, it's a place that's making disciples for the pastor, but not disciples of Jesus, that is not a church, that is a cult, okay? That, that's not a church, that is a business, and unfortunately, it is, our it is our biblical ignorance that empowers people to take advantage of us. I'm like, how is it in the text when we study the synoptic gospels, when we look at Jesus in the text, how is it he created atmospheres where people were honest with the issue? <laughs> My child has a demon. <laughs> My child is sick. I have a withered hand. And it was in church. Jesus was creating an atmosphere where this is where you come where I can help you exit that struggle. So for the next few weeks, I want to help us. And I want to give us biblical strategies on how to resist temptation. This is why every time you come to church, please hear me. Every time you come to church, be attentive. Because right now, you may not have a struggle, but September, you will. Your flesh may not be on fire right now. It's just our sides on fire, but not my flesh. But just wait until that right offer. Wait until the bank account numbers look right. Wait until you hit a season of loneliness. Wait until you start to think on thoughts that cause you to feel depressed. Just wait until that attack happens. Every time you come to the house of God, be intentional with taking notes because we serve the type of God who will give you a word before your season. So that when you hit that season, you can have an open book test. This is so good, y'all. I said all of that to say for part two of this series, I would like to speak around this thought from this subject for a few moments. Mixed signals. Have you ever got those before? Yes. All right, let's see how real we are. Have you ever given those before? Yes. Like you don't really like him? You just like Red Lobster Biscuits? <laughs> You're not really feeling her. She just better than watching porn tonight. Is this too real? <laughs> this too real? Mixed signals. Let's go a little deeper. Have you ever considered that we have given God mixed signals? Yeah. I'll trust you with this God, but, but in this season, I'm only going to trust my effort. Sometimes we talk. Other times I leave you on read. Sometimes I seek your face. Other time, I don't even represent or know who you are. Have you ever considered that mixed signals produces mixed results? And when you have mixed results and a mixed harvest, it gives birth to confusion? Because God is not the author of confusion. And could the reason be why I'm so confused is because I'm experiencing hell and heaven at the same time? And I'm blaming God for the hell, but God is saying the reason you're experiencing the hell is because you keep giving me mixed signals. We are selective with our surrender. And the reason we cannot exit certain struggles is because I surrender to you in this area, but I do not surrender to you in that area. And mixed living causes mixed Results and mixed results gives birth to confusion. So let's pray. Father God, would you flood this atmosphere? Would you allow us to evaluate ourselves? This is a word 
Not so that we can look to our neighbor, not so that we can look to our family members or, man, I wish they were to hear this. Help us to look at ourselves. And Father, we also ask for you to reveal to us every area in our life where we're blaming you for the outcome, but we're not surrendered to you in all things. Give us the wisdom and give us the grace to have unlimited surrender. All this study means absolutely nothing if you are magnified and if you aren't glorified. Anoint me as your oracle, the soundtrack of heaven, your PA system. We did not come to get inspiration. We came to get impartation. We're asking that you do it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who agrees with that prayer would just shout in the room, amen. Amen. So this is a confession I want all of us to say. You know how I do. I don't know if you quote the word over yourself on the regular, but I'm going to make sure when you come here you do. So can I get everybody to say this and everybody watching online, put this in the room in all caps. Can I get us to say, Father, Father, I I repent from lukewarm living. Help me to surrender. You deserve all of me. One more time. Father, I repent. For lukewarm living, help me to surrender. You deserve all of me. You deserve all of me. You deserve all of me. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we have launched this this brand new sermon series entitled Exit Strategies. Exit Strategies. Exit Strategies. And the reason... We're starting this series. I gave us this disclaimer last week. This one, this one's going to get messy. This one's going to get, it's going to get more messier, girl. (laughs) This is going to get messy. This is going to get dirty. We're going to deal with the uncomfortable issues. I'm talking about conversations that are usually low on the radar in the pulpit, but high on the radar in the pews. From pew to pew, row to row, and if we be honest, it's high on the radar from pulpit to pulpit. There are women and men of God all over the world who speak to crowds, who speak to streams, who speak to Facebook lives and IG lives and Zoom meetings, and they are brilliant at what they do. PhD in delivering the word, but GED in the word delivering them. But they're brilliant, though. Don't judge them. Brilliant at what they do. Brilliant at giving advice. GED and us looking at your life and being able to tell that your advice works. Thank you for the one golf clap. See, see, it's, it's one thing. Have you ever noticed sometimes people who give the most advice, like we can't tell that it works by looking at you? Like, (laughs) the confirmation and the byproduct that your method works is not your passion, bruh. God got to work. It's not your passion. It's your fruit. Can we look and see that your advice is making you fruitful in your life? Brilliant at what they do. Brilliant at information. GED at application. Brilliant. PhD in looking free, but GED in actually being free. And all it takes is the right trial. All it takes is the right storm. All it takes is the right pain. All it takes is the right heartbreak. All it takes is for an array of disappointments to happen on repeat. That part though. Like disappointment on repeat, disappointment there, disappointment here, disappointment there, disappointment here. All it takes is an array of disappointments on repeat, the right test that will cause us to get to this place. Do I really believe all this stuff? If you haven't got there yet, you will. Do I I really believe all this God stuff? I'm coming to church each and every week. What is it doing for me? It's hot, I'm walking, they got to have a shuttle pick me up because I can't find a parking spot. What am I doing all this for? Why am I doing all this? Do I really believe all of this Jesus, this, this God stuff, this prayer? Do I really believe that? And as I was studying and engaged in sermon prep, I began to ask myself, 
why do I feel the Holy Spirit is taking me the route of apologetics? Apologetics is a theological word that we learned in seminary. It simply means the ability to be able to defend your faith. It's okay, why are we going the route of apologetics? And I felt as though the Holy Spirit revealed it to me. It's because when my people experience pain after pain, disappointment after disappointment, setback after setback, test after test, and trial after trial, and storm after storm, and they're praying and they don't see the manifestation of that prayer ever happen, they start to doubt me. They start to doubt me. I'm trying to convince us, never confuse bad weather as a bad season. Never confuse bad weather as a bad season because watch this, the weather is usually the most severe in spring. What is that? The season of growth, the season of evolution, the season of coming out of a, a bitter winter. Sometimes it's just proof that your season is changing. Why are we dealing with apologetics. Do you really believe all this stuff? Like, do I really believe that there was and there is a Messiah who goes by the name in Hebrew of Yeshua HaMashiach? In English, that's Jesus Christ. The reason I'm going there, remember I told us apologetics, is because there are literal, literal people who say, I don't believe in none of that Jesus stuff. The New Testament was written in Greek. And there was no J in the letters. So I don't believe in that Jesus stuff. And then there are other people who say, it's not Jesus, bro. You're disrespecting him. It's Yeshua. Anybody ever heard this? It's not Jesus. It's Yeshua. I'm like, okay. Um, do we not understand that just because the language changes doesn't mean the meaning of the object does? Okay? Like... A compiled set of pages in English, we call that a book. In German, it's a book. In Spanish, it's a libro. In French, it's Levi. All different languages, but the same thing. So regardless if you call him Yeshua HaMashiach, regardless if you call him Jesus Christos, regardless if you call him Jesus Christ, demons tremble from them both. Doesn't matter which one you say. All I know is hell is scared of Yeshua. Hell is scared of Yeshua. Hell is scared of Jesus. Hell is also scared of Jesus Christos. They understand all of them. We're not about to major in minors. <laughs> do, I, do, I, do I really believe all this stuff? Do I really believe like God has this plan for my life and it's, and it's called a purpose and, and, and I have a destiny and there's this whole redemptive story where we got in trouble due to what happened in the Garden of Eden, and then they got kicked out the garden, and years later, a Messiah came by the name of Jesus, or Yeshua, or Jesus Christos, whatever you want to call it. He came, and he died on, our, died on the cross for our sins, but that's not where it stops. After he died for our sins, he got up with all power in his hand on the third day, and he holds the keys of hell and of death, but that's not where it stops. Then he goes to his disciples and shows him, I told you, just like I told you, and it was written that I am the Messiah, here are the holes in my hand, here's the hole in my side, but that's not where it stops. Then he ascends up to heaven, and he's sitting on the right side of God the Father, interceding for all of the saints, but that's not where it stops. After that, then the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost so that we could all have the comforter and we could all have this counselor, but that's not where it stops. Then we're supposed to go out into all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age, but that's not where it stops. One day he's coming back again. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Do, do I really... Believe all that because literally the evolutionary theory wants us to believe we're all accidents. We're all just some random accident. It's like until you going into a museum, you walk in the museum, you look and see this antique ancient painting on the ceiling. I mean, it's beautiful. This mural is beautiful, it's like artistic, the oil is right in place, everything is symmetrical, everything is all precise, everything is all in line, the cloud is painted with this masterful design and it connects perfectly to the blue sky. Now take all religion talk away. 
The first thing you would think to yourself is, this is beautiful. Who was the painter? Right? Let's take all religion, religion out of the way. First thing you would think is, man, that's beautiful. Who painted that? Right? Now, when you look at it, due to how dope it is, due to how masterful it is, and due to how awesome it is, you would then describe whoever did it must be brilliant. <laughs> Trying to get y'all to get this. Whoever did it, it must have been intentional because the precision of the paintbrush was too perfect on every line. This had to be a person who was intentional and brilliant. Now, atheism wants you to believe, look at that and say, a thunderstorm happened one day, the wind was blowing hard, the bucket of paint fell over, it splashed on the ceiling, and it just happened to go so perfectly. Really, this is what they want us to believe. It just happened. Now listen, it actually takes more faith. <laughs> it takes more faith for you to look at that painting and say it just happened than for you to have faith that somebody had to paint that. Is this making sense? Like, I'm like, bro, you got massive faith. You got more faith than some Christians. But your faith right now is meaningless because it's faith in nothing. Oh, if we can redeem that faith. Do I really believe all of this stuff? Do, do I really believe that prayer works? Because I have not received yet the return on my investment in devotion. I have not seen a return yet on the investment of my intercession. And so what happens is you end up starting getting mad at your pastor. You start getting mad at your friends. Any force or spiritual thrust in your life that tries to point to you be to believe in something greater than yourself, you start to get mad at them. Why? Because you keep hearing about a reality that you never experienced. This makes sense? So now I'm doubting what you're saying because I have never experienced it. And what I'm trying to get us to understand, it's not that I'm lying, it's that we love mixture. It's not that what I'm saying is not true, it's that we love mixing our way with his way, culture with the Bible, what I think with what he thinks. And so I'm getting mixed results, and since I'm never experiencing what you're saying, I doubt that you're telling the truth. And I'm gonna have faith in my doubt more than I do your doctrine. This is powerful, y'all. I wanna show you this, look at this text. I wanna show you this particular text. Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. The reason I'm doing this, y'all, is because the church has done an excellent job of telling us you're sinning, you're wrong. Okay, <laughs> done an excellent job of saying that sin was bad. I'm trying to get us to understand, okay, I understand the sin is bad, but how do I get out of it? Don't just constantly rebuke me. What are some biblical steps that can give me a strategy to not go back to the same thing that I kept on doing that you keep labeling is wrong? Now, I understand Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But there's something we're missing, y'all. We're going to go to Matthew in a second. I want to break this down. There's something we're missing about the crucifixion. <laughs> it was rocking me all week. I had to call my mom. I said, let me tell you what I saw. We're missing something about the crucifixion. Once Jesus died on the cross, they pierced him in the side, and blood and water flowed. Somebody say blood and water. Blood and water. One more time, blood and water. blood and water. Jesus was on the cross. They pierced him in the side, and blood and water flowed. The first Adam, God put to sleep and took from his side, took from his side a rib, which became Eve, which is Adam's wife. Genesis 4 literally says this is Adam's wife because there are people who say Eve was not Adam's wife. That's not doctrine. That's not. Genesis 4 literally says Eve is the wife of Adam. Now watch this. God put Adam to sleep, took out his rib, closed it back up, presented to him his wife. The second Adam was pierced in the side, and through his blood, we all can be his wife. You better throw your notebook. Revelation. Now, this is also what we miss. The blood and water flowed for a reason. 
the blood was for our sin. Like I hear people all the time, the blood covered our past, present, and future. I'm like, okay, uh, when Jesus died for me, all my sins were future. All of them. I wasn't here yet. So everything, like when he died, all my sins were future. So this means Jesus handled it before I ever messed up. Does this make sense, y'all? This gives me freedom. Before I ever got here, he handled it. So the blood is for your sin, but the water's for your life. He's called the living water. The water helps us live right. The water helps us think right. You're going to mess up, and when you do, the blood covered that part. But the water is going to continue to wash. The water is going to continue to restore. The water is going to continue to heal. The water is going to continue to give clarity. You're going to mess up. I understand that, but the blood covered that part. I need both. Somebody say both. This is why I believe the text tells us don't judge. Psalm 7, chapter 11 says God is a righteous judge. You know why he's the judge and not us? Because judges know all of the evidence. Judges know the full story. I know everything that happened. You're only judging them for the sin that you could see. But I know what, what happened behind the scene that caused them to get there. This makes sense? So you look at a brother and you say, man, he, he got some anger problems. God's like, don't judge. You don't know. When he was six, his daddy dropped him off at his mama's house and said he'll be back. And he never came back. And every time he heard brakes squeak, he looked out the window and thought that, he was da- that that was his daddy, but it wasn't. And that was when he was 10. He heard more squeak and he looked out the window and thought that that was his daddy. That was when he was 14. When there was a sea and a crowd of people on graduation day from high school, he was looking and he still didn't see his daddy. When he graduated from college, he was looking and he still didn't see his daddy. He asks his mama. His mama doesn't know where his daddy went. And so when you see him angry, you say, you got anger problems, bro. God said, don't judge, because I know the backdrop, and I'm going to wash him. You preach, and you see the fact that she's promiscuous. She's so fast, every man she gets, she let him move in, and every man she does, she keep on giving him the cheeks, and every single time he come over, I told you I got to be real, and we judge. And God said, you don't know that her uncle, she loved her uncle. And every single time her uncle came over, he molested her. That started when she was six years old. Now, she didn't know that her love language was quality time. But in her mind, she equated, the only way I can get you to spend time with me is due to sexual activity. So every single man I met in my life, I equate, if I want him to stay, I have to have a sexual performance. If I want the next person to say, I got to have a sexual performance. And so you see that she's promiscuous. I see she needs me. The blood go handle that. I'm not minimizing sin. I'm not minimizing sin. There's so many pastors who won't preach on sin. I'm like, sin is used in the Bible over 400 times. So if you are preaching and you never use the word sin, there's a 400% chance that you're preaching sugar. 400 times. We see the word sin in the text. So don't don't judge. I'm going to wash them. I'm doing this series for two reasons. Number one, this series is going to be submerged in water to wash us so we can stop battling in the dark and feeling as though God doesn't love you. I'm doing this series because God wants us to have freedom in the dark. Freedom in your car when you by yourself. Freedom when you're in your apartment by yourself. Freedom when you're in your house by yourself. God wants his people to stop being plagued by heavy hearts, busy minds, but timid faith. Enough with lying about where you are. I want to deal with that person and I want you to have freedom in secret places so that it can manifest in public places. Freedom and for it to be real during this series because destiny decisions will submerge in wisdom. But this series is going to be an arrow that's going to launch us into maturity. God wants his people to mature and maturity is not You having birthday after birthday, you getting old because you could be a gray hair, bald head, immature fool. Maturity is the process and the ability to outgrow what used to fit. This is so good, y'all. Maturity. How do you know if you're mature? Have you outgrown the attitude? 
that used to fit in 2019. That means you're growing in this area. Maturity. How do I know if I'm growing? Have you outgrown the five minutes? And now you're starting to pray 15 minutes. You've been praying five minutes since 1999. Well, it's about to be 2023 in six more months. Can I have a little bit more? You yourself, your stomach increased from six years old to 26 years old. Now, if your natural stomach can increase, why don't you think your spirit man's hunger can increase too? Talk Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. It says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When they sprouted, when the wheat sprouted, and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, um, didn't, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. See, when I first started my ministry tenure, I always had this crazy concept. If you have preached from a scripture before, don't preach from it again. God should give you fresh revelation. <laughs> and so I looked at this because I did a discernment series. And in part one, this was my foundational text. And I was only speaking about it from your ability to discern wheat from weeds. Right? But as I'm studying this week, God showed me something totally different. So hold on, look, look at it again. Look at it again. Notice a verse of emphasis, verse 25, it says, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. What a coward. <laughs> sowed weeds and then went away. One of the goals of the enemy, one of the goals of the enemy, because when they asked the master, symbolic of Jesus, like, yo, wh wh where did these weeds come from? How are you getting a mixed harvest? How are you getting mixed results? He said, an enemy did this. And this was something I didn't see when I preached it a year ago in the discernment series. I didn't see that one of the methods of the enemy is to get us to have lives that traffic in mixture. It's not just about discernment. But it's also, notice what the enemy likes to do. He likes to mix things up. <laughs> he likes to mix a lie with a little truth. He likes to mix a little salt with a little sugar. He likes to mix a little light with a little shade. This is how so many of us have got relationally confused because there's a mixed signal of heaven in them and then there's also a mixed signal of hell in them. And this text is showing us, you know how Satan loves to work? He loves to get us to be okay with lukewarm mixture. He loves to get us to swim in the swamp of lukewarm. Because if they're lukewarm, they're going to get mixed results. Look at this. Look at this. They came and was like, oh, did, didn't, didn't you sow good seeds? Where, where did all these weeds come from? Aren't they supposed to be Christians? Why do they keep cursing people out and they would just have their hands during praise up talking about all of me, I give you all of me. Isn't that kind of messed up? <laughs> these are your people, right? Where, where, where do all these weeds come from? How do we have all these people claiming Jesus but then hate certain races? Where, where did that come from? These are your people, right? That's what Christians do? I don't want to fool with no Christians. Where, where do all these pastors come from who act like they love people but they're really wolves in bishop collars? These are your people, right? Whose man's is this? <laughs> These are your people, right? How is, it, how is it 
she will like readily reject a man who lives with his mama, but then will readily accept a man who lives with his wife. <laughs> These your people, right? These your people. This too much? These your people, right? <laughs> These yours, right? This is what a Christian is, right? This is what a follower of Jesus is, right? It's a misrepresentation. And so what he does is if I can get them to mix up their life, they will have a mixed up harvest and it will mix people up and they won't look up to God because when they look at his representatives, all they see is lukewarm. I know we don't like this. I got to help us grow. Hell loves mixture and if we be honest no judgment in the room we, we don't do that that's God's job if we be honest we love mixture too don't don't put me all the way in the light I ain't there God ain't through me yet <laughs> but, but don't put me in the dark I, I believe in Jesus don't, don't call me a child of the light because I'll still knock and buck on the heifer if she try me. Like I'm saved, but these hands aren't. <laughs> but, but, but don't call me a devil or a counterfeit. We love contrast. Contrast right in the middle. Can I say it how I want to say it? Yes. Christian shades of gray. Holy Ghost. Christian shades of gray. I'm not all the way there, but I'm not all the way here. Christian shades of gray. Mixture. Mixture. Lukewarm living. Hear me. This is how I'm trying to help us, y'all. This is how we are experiencing heaven in one area of our life and hell in another area of our life because God is a gentleman. He only comes in by invitation, all right? And I tried to get us to understand in our King Encounter series, when God comes into your heart, he's not coming in as a house guest. He's coming in as a landlord. I'm coming in as a boss. I see that your, your dining room is nice. You got potpourri and, and boiled fish and unleavened bread for me. That's nice. But can I go in the basement and deal with your porn addiction? That's why I really want to go. Let's go down there. I can't go there. I can't go there. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I see your bathroom is nice. You just color coordinated this. This is beautiful. This smells good. Your plugins. This is so nice. But, 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 but can I go in the bedroom of your lusto? That's where I really want to go. And, and, and I don't know why you tried to clean up when I knocked. I already knew before I knocked. I just want you to give me permission to go in that room. Can I go in there? I can't go in there. I can't go in there. Okay. Well, this is great. I love your kitchen. It's so beautiful. But I really want to go to your master room because I want to deal with that resentment and that bitterness that you have towards your mother and that bitterness you have towards that ex-church and that bitterness that you have towards an ex-spouse. I want to go in there so I can give you another perspective because once you understand that they weren't healed, you'll understand that you only got the after effects of what they were going through. It wasn't necessarily a devil or a demon. He was broken. Can I go in there? Because any room you don't let me in is a room where hell can wreak havoc in. And I'm tired of my children blaming me for the condition of your peace. And I'm in your heart saying, I want every room. But I won't barge in. I got to be invited. And so now we have lifestyles. Mixed fruit. Mixed harvests. And it's confusing you. And I'm trying to give you the reason why your harvest is mixed is because my life is mixed. Somebody say mixed signals. Look at this. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Look what Jesus says. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Very, very short passage of scripture. But I want you to see what Jesus says. And Luke chapter 6, verse 46. It says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You give me mixed signals. Like, you're not committed, you're interested. Hmm. You're interested. 
Effort is a direct reflection of your commitment. I'm not asking you to be perfect. When you screw up, when I screw up, because we will, the blood is going to handle that. But let me wash you. I'm just confused on why, why you keep calling me Lord. But you hate my teaching. Why, why you keep calling me Lord? But you don't want to hear my word. I, I, that's the part that's confusing to me. Just like you would be confused if you had a person in your life who was saying they loved you, but constantly kept hurting you, you would be like, okay, either, either I'm tripping or you tripping. And in this case, God's not tripping. Well, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? Sometimes we talk, sometimes we don't. Sometimes you seek my face, sometimes you don't. The only time you worship is when Tanisha says, lift your hands. Be transparent for me. The only time that you would used to study the Bible was for a sermon. And so we're not talking outside of sermon prep. But when life is good for you, we're not communi communicating. I told y'all, this is a double-edged sword. Cuts me, cuts you too. Nobody cares about a pastor who appears to be right. They want one that's real. What, what could be happening in our life is we have mixed signals. Like, I want to be blessed, but then I don't want to obey. Mixed signals. I want, ooh, it's about to get real. Y'all not going to like me for like 90 seconds. <laughs> okay. I want God to give me a husband, but you're not even prepared for Jesus' return. Mixed signals. Why would I underline your idolatry? We're not talking now. Wanting, wanting to have a godly woman while you still currently are sexing a Jezebel woman. Mixed signals. Mixed signals. I'm not going to set my queen and my daughter to be hurt by you. Mixed signals. Like wanting a wealthy and love marriage but have no patience, keep a record of wrong, poor relational work ethic. Mix. I'm going here. Mix, mix signals. Mix signals. Like, I want to be treated like a king. You are. But you want to hump everything too? Like, that, that, that's more collar behavior than, than crown behavior, right? Mixed mix, mix signals. It's not that you're not a king. It's, it's the, 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 the mixed signals. Oh, you fly. You slayed your makeup, sis. You slayed your dress. Can't slay attitude, though. Like, like you, you, could, you match well. You match your purse with your outfit. But you can't match babies with daddies. Mix, mixed signals. My generation requires real, y'all. So, <laughs> this, I'm trying. I'm trying. So look. <laughs> so look, look. What happens, what happens is we're blaming God for the harvest. And he's like, I'm not doing this. It's, 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 the, it's the lukewarm living that we see no issue with. Clear, you are not going to be perfect. When we mess up, the blood will cover that. It's the washing that we're resisting. Okay? Look, look, look. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Listen to this. It says... I know your works, that you are neither hot or cold. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So Jesus like saying, listen, either go all in for the world or all in for me. I don't want you to be lukewarm. I will vomit, spew you. And as I research, okay, vomit is kind of like, Dis disgusting, right? And so what God is saying is it doesn't sit well with me. Like when you eat something that doesn't sit well, it, 
makes you want to, it doesn't sit well with me how you could taste my goodness and still want the world too. That doesn't sit well with me. Now look, look, understanding the difference. Lukewarm does not mean you're struggling, okay? I got to give clarity. Lukewarm means I want covenant and I want a side piece too. Make it more clear. Lukewarm is I want to be the bride of Christ and I want to be the mistress of the world at the same time. I don't want to give up one. A struggle is when I'm detoxing from me used to being in you. Does this make sense? Like, I want to go back sometimes, but I'm fighting it. That's a struggle. That, that's not lukewarm. Because once you experience Christ, you will sometimes have urges for what you used to have. That doesn't mean you're not saved, nor does that mean you're lukewarm. That means you are being sanctified. 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 God is changing you. He's detoxing. See, withdrawals from what you used to have is normal. Ooh, lift that weight off. It's like, am I saved? Because I still kind of want, you know, pastor, I still kind of. <laughs> That's normal. All that is, is your heart's way of raging because your pattern is changing. That's it. Toxicity is leaving your body and your flesh is screaming for it. That's a struggle, not lukewarm. Lukewarm, I want to be in the bride. I want to be the bride, and I want the world. I don't see a problem with it. I don't want to stop it. I don't see why it's wrong. This is what I want to do. This is how God made me. If God can't accept me for me, and you can't accept me, this is how I was made. That's lukewarm. It's like a man who is married saying, I want you and her. Be okay with it. Be okay with she coming over tonight. Cook something for both of us. <laughs> Y'all laughing. I want us to fully get it so that we won't confuse what I'm saying. I'm not putting condemnation. I'm giving clarity. Okay? I want both of y'all. Versus the one that recognizes that it's wrong and is trying to stop. Okay? That's the difference. Can I keep going? So the whole point of this is God saying, I want you to experience these two kingdom ethics, joy and peace. That's what this whole conversation is about. Joy and peace. Look, look, shalom. It's the Hebrew word for peace. It does two things. Number one, peace in shalom, first definition, means wholeness. To be complete. Shalom. Jesus is the prince of peace. Jehovah Shalom. He's the God of my peace, and that completes me. What I tried to get us to see last week is sin doesn't complete. That's how we get in cycles, because we keep on trying to find the joy again. All right? But Jehovah Shalom completes that part. Does this make sense? Second definition of peace is the absence of agitation. This is why the text says, I give you peace that surpasses your understanding. Because it means this situation is agitating, but it's not agitating your peace. And that surpasses your understanding because I should be agitated, but shalom gives me peace to where I'm absent of internal agitation. This makes sense? Shalom. Shalom. So let's go a little deeper. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Verse 5, it says, but he, speaking of Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. This is letting us know the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Iniquities and transgressions take peace. They take peace. This is, I want to get you out of this cycle because it's taking your peace. You can't sleep because of a mixture lifestyle. It takes peace. And I want to give you peace. 
And as I was breaking the word down, transgression, if you really look at it, it derives from the word trespass. To transgress means you're not even supposed to be over here. Transgressions. It is a willing disobedience. Willing to do it. Think trespass. This is not your property. You are trespassing her body right now, sir. This is not yours. You are trespassing his body, ma'am. This is not your, that's transgression, okay? Iniquity is deeper though. Iniquity is premeditated. Bloodline deep, planning. Like an iniquity is like you purchased your vacation in March to go 4th of July weekend, knowing y'all gonna have sex the whole time, knowing y'all gonna get drunk. I have planned this. Ooh, I'm coming for somebody's vacation package. I planned this. No covenant, but I want covenant benefits though. See? (laughs) Y'all see y'all faces. I'm just being obedient. Now look, look. What God messed me up, God messed me up as I was studying this. Notice, wounded for your transgressions. A wound is blood you can see, right? Bruised for your iniquities. Bruised is a blood vessel that burst underneath the skin. So he's saying, I bled for stuff everybody could see, and I also bled for the secrets that nobody know about. All of that. Is this good, y'all? Give you more Bible. Psalms 51, verse 12. David says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. This is after the Bathsheba situation. He's repenting. And he's saying, restore unto me the joy. Look, y'all. Meaning, I'm not getting joy in my crown. I'm not getting joy in my kingdom. I'm not getting joy in my, in my, my reigning over people. What brings me joy is knowing you saved me. So let me get that back. I lost it with Bathsheba and Uriah. Let me get that joy back because that's what's going to keep me. Not this kingdom, not this crown, not this robe. I get joy out of being saved. Now look, a passage that most of us have quoted. I want to show you this. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. I'm going to only read one part. It says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Okay, now it makes sense. All right, let's put the chart up that we had last week. Now it makes sense. All right. So he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. All right. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. The joy of the Lord is your strength. How many of us heard that before? But I was like, what does that look like, though? And then I got it. When I have joy in the Lord, that's my strength to not go back to that. The joy of knowing I haven't masturbated. The joy of knowing I haven't got drunk in 90 days. The joy of knowing I'm reading my Bible. That's going to strengthen me when the passing sins are coming before me. So the joy of the Lord is your strength. What's going to strengthen you from going back to that is the joy in him. Does this make sense? When I have no joy in him, I keep trying to find it in this. Keep trying to find it in that. So now it makes sense. In Psalms chapter 16, verse 11, when it says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And your right hands are pleasure forevermore. I want to be real, y'all. When I was trying to change my life and I wanted to stop looking at porn and all that stuff, I said, God, listen, I need you to show me that you can give me pleasure better than that. Because the reason I keep going back to that is due to the pleasure. Show me that I can have more pleasure in you than I could ever find in this. Because if I don't have more pleasure in you than I have in this, I'm never going to give up this. So how do I get pleasure in you? Gosh, I'm preaching. I'm bound by this and I don't have pleasure in you. I find pleasure in this. How do I get free? And it was in this text. You're not dwelling in my presence, son. You're not seeking my face. You're not praying. 
There's no present life with you. It's only presentation with you. So you want to be free? You got to get in my presence. You got to get in my presence. This is not old school, y'all. This is Bible. So now, many of us don't even recognize. You see this power supply right here? It's symbolic of your flesh. Somebody say the flesh. flesh. Now look, this is always going to give power to whatever you plug in it. Your flesh is never dead. <laughs> you love Jesus, your flesh don't. But the reason these lights have power is because they're plugged into the power supply. See, a lot of us think we're free because the light's off. <laughs> you think you're free. I'm good. I've been, I've been pure. Okay, the right sir or sis hasn't turned you on yet. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And so you think to yourself, oh, I'm free from that. I'm over that. I'm not even tempted by that. That doesn't even bother me. I could watch those things. I can go there. Let me, let me show y'all something real quick. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So what Paul is telling him, it's like, yo, you think you're free because nothing turns you on yet. You think you're free, you haven't gone back over mama house yet. Right? You, you think you think you over them, wait till you see them again. <laughs> this is so good. You, you really believe you're no longer tempted by that. Wait till you smell weed again. Just smell it. <laughs> this is so real, y'all. So this is never going to die. But what you can do is crucify it, the passions and crucify the desires so that when the temptation comes, it's not even giving it power. It's not giving it power. But listen, I want to be crystal clear. The thing about this bad boy, the flesh, regardless of how many sermons you hear, if you ever plug it back, <laughs> if you ever, I don't care how much Bible you know, if you ever plug it back, it's going to give it power again. Because the flesh is a power supply to our passions and our desires. I wonder who under the sound of my voice is overlooking the passion. The passions. Point number one. Joy is a psycho repellent. It's a psycho repellent. If you find pleasure in Jesus, it keeps you from trying to recreate the pleasure in alcohol does this make sense if you find pleasure in the Lord it will keep you from grinding so hard because you don't trust that God controls the outcome you actually believe your grind does it's a, it's, it's a cycle repellent number two joy is the motor of defiance towards sin no joy, no defense mechanism towards sin. The reason so many people fall into cycles is because they're trying to find joy. But joy is the motor of defiance. You want to defy your flesh? You got to have joy in the Lord. Number three, we fight from joy, not for joy. I'm fighting from joy. Remember the chart. I'm already filled with joy. So I could resist your lies that that will give me joy. Fight from joy, not for joy. Number four, four joy and gratitude are siblings. Joy doesn't make you have gratitude, but it's our gratitude that makes us filled with joy. Is this making sense? This is how you become joyful. 
because joy doesn't make you have gratitude. It's our gratitude that makes us filled with joy. Last one, number five, starve the flesh. Starve it. Don't play with it. Don't pet it. Don't think that you're that strong. It will embarrass you, I promise. Doesn't matter how much you think you feel with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, know all the books in the Bible, quote them all, been in seminary. It does not matter. The flesh will embarrass you. Whatever you plug into it, it will provide it with power. So starve it. Don't quench his thirst. It's going to be difficult. It's going to detox. That's normal. That's what it feels like when toxicity is leaving the body. And you will fall short. Jesus handled that before we got here. Was this good for somebody?